All right. Um, before we talk about uh, Songs for Sparrows, a record I really like a lot, <laughs> that I spent a lot of time with, especially in the last week. I hope you don't mind if I ask you about your early life and stuff. No. No problem. Because you, you've had a really fascinating life. Can you just tell us about your childhood and where you grew up and what that was like and when you discovered music? Boy, no one's ever asked me that before. Um, so we were a pretty middle-class family in the San Fernando Valley, uh, controlling Jewish parents. Uh, so, you know, I never became the doctor MD uh, that they wanted or lawyer. And I joined the angry Samoans summer after graduating undergraduate at UCLA. And uh, as my mom said about two years ago, I broke your father's heart when you became an angry Samoan, you know, but what can you do? Um, but, you know, I grew up in a pretty uh, normal middle-class family in the San Fernando Valley and uh, always was into math, always, uh, you know, um, I, I, the first sense of, uh, you know, um, I don't know what the word is, uh, nonconformity that I sort of joined was watching Roger Corman old 50s B-horror movies like Attack of the Crab Monsters and um, Not of This Earth, and, which I loved, um, and uh, Curse of the Demon by Jacques Turner, which is not a schlock movie. It's a really beautiful and uh, noir movie. Um, so there was that and professional wrestling before it turned into like a sissy circus that Vince McMahon made a bad cartoon out of it. But it was when, when I was growing up as a kid, it was unscripted. And uh, my, I remember my idol, John Tolos, uh, the golden Greek. Yeah. He would do this race baiting and not, not to a fault of being, you know, terribly, uh, you know, unwoke, but uh, he would be fighting, having a title match with the Mexican folk hero, Raul Mata. And he, out of a bag, he produces a burrito and starts strangling it and stopping it on the ground. He goes, I eat feta cheese. Look what goes in these guys' guts. And, you know, that kind of stuff was just like, oh, my God, my friend and I would just you know, spend hours watching that stuff. So it almost seemed like a natural segue to the Angry Simones. Uh Haystack Calhoun, Gorilla Monsoon. <laughs> I think I know what you're talking when about. It I, when, it, when it was good. I have to ask you, because I lived in uh, the, the Valley myself uh, when I was working for labels out there. We're in the Valley. Uh, what's now called Valley Village or Studio City. It was, oh, okay. uh, yeah, near, near uh, Whitsitt and Riverside. Yeah, I lived on uh, Moore Park and uh, Coldwater. Okay, sure. And right. also in Encino, I had this guest house in Encino, which was really cool. I lucked out with that. Do you know what rents are going for there now? I can only imagine. I have a friend there, and he told me he rents a little two-bedroom, 1,200-square-foot cottage with a tiny yard, 4400 a month. What? Yeah. I thought we were crazy in Boston, man. That is insane. Uh, My yeah, God. Believable. Um. What kind of music? When, when did you first start listening to music? And what, what is your recollection of some of the first music you heard when you were young? Uh, the first record that really blew me out was uh, Gimme Gimme Some Lovin' by the Crazy Elephant. Uh, I love that song and, um, you know, silly stuff. Um, but then th this was when I was like 11, 12 years old. And then it morphed into... Uh, you know, more heavy stuff when I was in, um, well, it must have been 1968, 69. Um, the first two records that I somehow got a hold of, I think by an older brother, um, that I just wore the grooves out of was the first Velvet Underground record. And this band from Michigan that was huge in Michigan, but didn't get much respect outside of that called SRC. And uh, they were terrific. And then it was moving on from there. I mean, the Velvet certainly and... Uh, um, you know, it, it, it just sort of had a timeline to it of all the things I picked up on. It wasn't punk until 1976 or five that really sort of got me going. If my uh, research is correct, you started writing for a magazine called Backdoor Magazine? Right, Backdoor Man. Backdoor and, Man. Like, like the song. And uh, Oh, okay. Yeah, I came in on like 1976, I think, or five, and it was a really raucous, vitriolic, 
hard rock, R-A-W-K fanzine, where there really wasn't too much of that going around, let alone in Los Angeles. And it was, you know, just really passionate and, you know, nasty at times. And, you know, the rest of the guys were just into anything loud. I, I didn't never cared for things like Aerosmith that they championed. But, you know, we had a very mutual uh, passion for early Blue Oyster Cult and things like that. And this led you to Cream Magazine. Yeah, I was writing a couple of my pieces, uh, caught the attention of my friend Billy Altman, who was the editor of Cream, and he they needed uh, someone to chop meat. So I was sort of the candidate that they got a hold of. I, I my, The most fun I had, right? I mean, they would really let me get away with a lot of shit. And uh, I, there was a Ted Nugent album reviewed, and I wrote it as a Dear Ted letter and said, why don't you get a hold of a Gibson melody maker because they're great guitars to learn how to play. And if you practice your scales, someday you might be okay. <laughs> now, you you never worked in Detroit, though. You Were were you basically just in California? Yeah, I, I, I was in California all my life until 93 when I moved to New Mexico. So uh, I had Robert Duncan on the show a, while, a little while back. He was a managing editor at Cream, but it was a few years before you were there. Did you ever get to meet um, Lester Bangs? Of course, I have to ask you that question. I crossed paths with Lester once, even before I was writing for Cream, and uh, but not again, and certainly not before he died. Um, very funny guy. But you guys were both there at the same time for a little while, right? Well, it overlapped a tiny bit in the very beginning. I started writing for Cream in, I believe it was 76, all the way to 1988. Wow. Did you do a lot of reviews or features or what were you it's, doing there? I started with a lot of album reviews. And, uh, um, you know, again, I got to really just knock things down. Like there was a Suzy Quattro album that I had fun with. And uh, Mike Chapman, who produced it, wrote me back and said, you know, you're not very clever. You should chop meat. Um, <laughs> uh, things like that. But then I got to do some features. I interviewed Ozzy Osbourne, who was the sweetest guy in the world. He took me to an Indian restaurant in Hollywood and showed me pictures of his dogs and kids. And, you know, I didn't know it was a, a live animal they threw on stage. I thought it was a prop. <laughs> oh, <laughs> and then Len, Lemmy from Motorhead was another very sweet, actually pretty articulate guy. And uh, who else? Uh, Rocky Erickson, uh, you know, things that I really wanted to do. That's fantastic. Um, OK, while you started doing that, you formed the band VOM, which does that uh, short for Vomit? Yes, I thought so. With uh, Mike Saunders, who you ended up playing with and Richard Meltzer. Can you talk a little bit about that band? I know you guys put out a five song EP, but I think that came out. Did that come out after the band had? broken up yeah, or not broken up about after about a year after we started um it, you know the passion i had in 1974 five was for this new york band the dictators that no oh, one yeah. had, no one had ever heard of then this was just before go girl crazy their first record came out and Meltzer had moved from new york to los angeles and he was their friend and everybody's saunders too was everyone the word was check out this band the dictators and mm -hmm. My friend Sandy Perlman had produced it, and uh, it just seemed like a continuum of the same sort of thing, and you know, from Blue Oyster Cult. But it wasn't. It was funny. No one got the joke of their songs. <laughs> At the same time, a lot of people felt that there wasn't a place for being that funny in rock and roll. Um, but anyway, it was the passion of that that drew me and Meltzer and Saunders together, and Vom sort of was a natural sort of uh, evolution of that. But it took a while. Now, when you guys were playing out, you must have been one of the earlier punk leaning bands at that time in L.A. Because it wasn't until like, what, 79, 80 that it really started happening? About 77, 78, actually. What happened is Meltzer and I were at a weirdo show in downtown L.A. And people didn't mosh pit, pit then. They pogoed. They jumped up and down. Right. And so Meltzer did it, too. Joined the crowd. And so did I. And he looked at me. Oh, look, I can do it also. <laughs> So that sort of began Vaughn. I mean, he thought if I can do it, then let's get going. And we had all these obnoxious, offensive songs that he wrote the lyrics. One was called um, Electrocute Your Cock, Electrocute Your Cock, Looking for a Hand Job, Stick It in a Clock, which we thought was just so patently dumb, but funny. 
And, um, you know, I'm in love with your mom, which later became sort of an early Samoan song. Uh, and we used to like load up on critters. Um, Meltzer and I went down to this place in Compton, which is a dicey area for those that don't know that. Yeah. There's a place called Rainbow Mealworm and Bait. And we went down there and got a whole box of what were called Bronco worms because they bucked up from the ground. And then there were like frozen sheep eyeballs and all this stuff that we just loaded up on. And our idea was to be sort of punk rock bad guy wrestlers. So we would set up barbed wire at the front of the stage and the guitarist, the rhythm guitarist would dump trash behind it. And that got people going real quick. So we play like a cover of the doors. Uh, My eyes have seen you and Meltzer would throw out the sheep eyeballs. And then, <laughs> oh my God. And then we had a song called I Live With The Roaches. <laughs> But you couldn't buy live roaches at stores, so you had to get crickets. So we threw out the crickets, and the owners got really PO'd at that because they hated the chirping. Everything else you could clean up. Um, and it became like a free-for-all, like a brawl. And if we played the whiskey, and it got so bad that the man, that the PA guy and the manager turned off the sound halfway through, kicked us off the stage, and said, you're going the way of that asshole Morrison. Get out. Okay. And we look. We looked at each other and go. All right. Okay. That's pretty good. Well, this seems like a good gradual progression to the angry Samoans. <laughs> yeah. Well, when you know Mel Melzer was getting tired after two years physically, and uh, you know we all sort of like thought we could take it as far as we can. You know, anachronisms being just that after you've done something for two years, and uh, after about six months, Saunders and I sort of huddled. And uh, I thought, well, you know, we like these songs, some of them, we could continue. And I convinced him that it would be fun. And we were watching, again, wrestling Saturday morning. And uh, there was this tag team called the Wild Samoans. Oh, off yeah. of Zika. And, uh, you know, Saunders was watching. He goes, oh, they're pretty wild, but I, I wish they'd be more angry. Bam. Oh, nice. So, yeah. That was, that, and it began after that, God help us. I think it's all their grandsons now that are all in the WWE, the, the, fan, the Samoan family. Down the road, the Samoans did this video with Richard Casey, who, who produced and directed a lot of Blue Oyster Cult videos. He knew Perlman and Meltzer, I think. And he did a video with us, and it was a, called uh, the Kenji Shibuya Incident, who was another bad guy wrestler. And the idea was we were on – we were – doing a press conference and Shibuya came with his crew and beat us up and, and created fake angry Samoans. And I got Tolos to be a part of it. And he wore an angry Samoans t-shirt. And I thought I should die tomorrow because my life's not going to get better than this. Well, you really were a big wrestling fan. I remember going to see like um, Son Chief J Strongbow and Sonny sure. King and all these guys in the little yeah. armory where I grew up, you know, it was like a, There'd yeah. be like a hundred people there, you know. <laughs> there was there was the Devonshire Downs in Northridge, and then there was the Olympic Auditorium in downtown. Oh, yeah. And I used to go there all the time at age 13 or 14. It was a dicey sort of proposition, but my friend and I we couldn't turn it down. Wow. Uh and so around 19 in 1980, you put out inside my brain, and I have to ask you, how did you cross paths with Lee Ving? I know he produced. Well, we were always, record. you know, Fear had had a couple of years under their belt. We thought they were just great. I mean, not just the energy. Lee was, you know, again, it was sort of like a, once more a bad guy wrestler. He would bait the crowd. Certainly there was a certain amount of gay baiting and homophobe ick stuff. But, uh, you know, and I wasn't on board for that so much. However, it, it was a it was a ruse. I mean, it was like a cartoon. So it seemed okay. Plus, you know, it was punk rock. Anything goes. I mean, anger, hatred, you know, vile, vitriol, whatever. Uh, so they were the epitome of that. So we were big fans. And then we asked Lee if he would come down. We recorded with Spot, who just passed away. Yeah. In, uh, SST land out in Redondo Beach. Went into a studio. And Lee came a few times and just sort of walked around. And, <laughs> you know, like the way Lee does. And that was pretty much it. I mean, he, I don't know how much production he really did, but it was just, we wanted to be affiliated with it. And then it wasn't until the Rodney song where we start getting banned everywhere we went 
uh, that Lee said, please don't put my name on that record. You know, I, I don't like him, but, you know, he controls everything in this town. You're talking about get off the air. Yeah, right. That, that was a big contra. I didn't get to L.A. until 84, but everyone kind of knew about that. If you were into hardcore and punk, you heard about that that song and what happened. So did you basically get banned from every club in L.A.? So what happened is we wrote that song and put it out. It wasn't until we put it out on the record. And we just thought, again, it was being so silly and stupid, uh, you know, that he would probably go, you know, the guy's IQ peaked out at about 60. And he was just sort of this itinerant, you know, hanger on and groupie uh, from the, you know, Hollywood and L.A. And so we just thought he'd listen to the song and just go, yeah, huh, they hate me. It's punk rock. But he didn't. And, you know, we had lyrics like, the best line I ever wrote, I think, in any song was 8 p.m. and Rodney's on the air. He's beating off in Joan Jett's hair. <laughs> oh, my God. How, how can you take offense at that? You know? <laughs> and uh, so he was his radio show was really gaining ahead of steam. And, and it was the, really the only outlet on media to promote punk rock. And it was the end of the 70s, really. And. He he got crazy about it and told any band that played with a, that would play if they refused to play with us he would give them extra radio time and then same thing to the clubs and so we couldn't play anywhere in Hollywood or L A and instead had to play all the skate shows out in Long Beach and Whittier and things like that. However, we were playing with bands that were also pariahs like T S O L and Social Distortion and things like that. And, you know, we, half of us still had long hair and played these slogging tempos. So we were scared that they'd beat the shit out of us if we didn't triple time everything and cut our hair. And, and inadvertently, we became popular. I don't know wow. if it would have happened if we played the same Hollywood circuit, like the Screamers or, you know, things like that. Um, and, and I should say what's really important is we were Valley kids. My Saunders and I, the thing we shared the most was just despising the clique and the worship of celebrity and fame and notoriety. And it was just so incestuous. And so there were people like Kim Fowley and Rodney that just celebrated that. So it was just nauseating to us. And as a result, you know, we got sort of uh, became priors ourselves in those circles, which was okay. There weren't a lot of bands that came from the Valley, were there? No, really not. I mean, I'm trying to think. There were gigs in the Valley, but we were really one of the only ones that I can think of. That you know, Mike lived in Van Nuys. I lived in North, what was called North Hollywood at the time. Um, things like that. So we we had, you know, a completely different. Todd, our bass crazy bass player, I think he lived in Sherman Oaks or in or in Studio City. Um, it, it was a different type of anger. Yeah. Well, I mean, I know Redondo and her, uh, uh, Hermosa Beach is where a lot of those bands came from, the California bands. Right. Um, on the Back From Samoa record, um, you I have to ask you this question. You right. have uh, the song, They Saved Hitler's Cock. Did right. you, were you guys aware of the song, They Saved Hitler's Brain by Unnatural Acts? Or was that a complete coincidence? Not the song, the movie with, with um, who was it? Richard Basehart, I think. It was a, the brain, the, they say Hitler's brain, the brain doesn't come out until the very end of the movie. So it felt like a ripoff. You keep wanting the brain. And so that just thought, all right, well, what about cock instead of brain? So it had nothing to do with the unnatural act song. I didn't, I until I didn't ever even heard of it until you're telling me now. Really? Uh, they were yeah. like an underground punk band in Boston. That was a big okay. hit local hit for them matter of fact when the dead kennedys and all these bands came through town they always wanted unnatural acts to play with them uh, i, I knew ssd them. control and uh some of the other bands we played with at the rat and there was a uh, place called the channel that we yeah 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 i just saw a band last night called the long wait and jamie from ssd is in the band it's the first time he's played in a band wow. since he was in slap shot you know when we so, played Boston was one of our biggest turnout cities. And when we first played there, I think it was 83 or four, um, there were these five little, they weren't so little, I mean, but 16, 17 year old kids that were sort of following us around. They had listened to all the records. Oedipus started playing the record, but yeah. he turned off by the song Homosexual. And I had to assure him that the song was credited to Jay Falwell, you know, that there was a sense of, 
ridiculousness about it. And we it wasn't anti-homo or pro-homo, it was ambivalent homo, just confused. So after that, he dug it and started playing the stuff. And so these a lot of kids would turn out when we played. And so one of them was this short haired blonde guy that took us to his uncle's penthouse suite that was empty. We watched Reanimator, which is <laughs> one of my favorite movies of all time. And it turned out that guy was Evan Dando. Wow, wow that's cool. Yeah, we kept was... it a little bit. Yeah, well, you see, I was in college radio around that time, and that's how I found out about the Angry Samoans. You guys were getting a lot of college radio play in Boston. I right. mean, I think that college radio had a lot to do with people coming out to your show. Oh, that, absolutely. There's nothing like that now anymore. And, uh, you know, when we played the channel, which had a huge amount of turnout, I mean, that place was full. And we thought we were opening. We didn't even know we were headlining. So the promoter had flo flown us out to stay at a Marriott I thought, why is he going? He must have a ton of money to do this for an opening act. And we came there going, what the fuck? And we, you know, it was crazy. We played Lights Out, the Poke Your Eyes Out song in the middle of the set. And there's about 20 kids in the front that had white plastic forks that did mock eyeball impalement gestures. And I almost passed out. I thought one of them's going to slip. The parents are going to be personal injury attorneys. And this is going to be worse than Black Sabbath backmasking, kill yourself, you know? I was very aware of the song Lights Out, and I heard about that incident. Unfortunately, I wasn't there, which I was. I heard all about that. That's a famous one. Now, there was a period of time in between 82 and 88, and I didn't know if you uh, – did you – I know – I remember Dean and Pete from Triple X. Those guys kind of got involved and helped you guys out, and, and, you, and you put uh, STP, not LSD. I Lost My Mind, actually. It was one of my favorite songs that you oh, guys thanks. had. And that came out, I think, did we was the band still actually together in 88? Oh, yeah. 91 was the last show we played. Oh, that long. Laundry. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, yeah, we did Yesterday Started Tomorrow, which was a 12-inch EP, and then STP and on LSD. And, you know, we could have gone the route of doing another Back from Samoa, and if we had probably risen to the top of, uh, you know, the hardcore scene. I mean, we were gaining ahead of steam because the record was distributed by Faulty Records, which was a subsidiary of IRS. And we had sold, apparently, if you can believe this, about 200,000 records. Really? Wow. Yeah, but we got, we got ripped off because they went bankrupt. Was that the Triple X record? Uh, it was our own. We were on Bad Trip Records. Bad Trip, Triple Bad X. Trip. We yeah. released it. And, uh, you know, so we could have seen a lot of money. And they, I mean, it wasn't only us, Alternative Tentacles, Jello's record, and all that kind of, all of SST to some extent were all ripped off. Faulty Product, was that the name of it? Faulty Product? Faulty Products, yeah, they yeah. were the distributor. And I think they did some original pressings too. But um, yeah, so we, we, we started gaining, you know, if we had done a second record like Back from Samoa, I think we could have just, you know, built up, but the mosh pits things just started seeming like a joke. I mean, it was just sort of a parody of itself after a few yeah. years. And I thought, what the hell? You know, so mm -hmm. the love of Saunders and I was 60s punk rock, the Shadows of Night, Standells, um, Chocolate Watch Band from San Francisco, things like that. And uh, we thought, you know, all right, let's 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 lean in that direction. So we did, it, so less punk rock, more less punk rock by 1980s standards and uh, less hardcore, I should say. And um, more of that. And STP was sort of, you know, sort of a hybrid of that kind of stuff too. So it wasn't that long after that, that you actually left the band and you moved to Santa Fe and you have a PhD in mathematics, right? Right. Yeah. Was I supposed to be calling you Dr. Turner during this interview? Is that, <laughs> Whatever you like. <laughs> the publicist didn't tell me that, you know, if that, if I had to do that or not, <laughs> um, I got to ask, I know you got a, your degree in, in New Mexico, but Al Quint, I don't know if you know him. He's like a well-known underground, hardcore punk writer. He put out suburban voice. He wrote for maximum flip side. He told me something that I have to ask you about. Yeah, He told me that you worked at Clark University in Worcester. And the reason I'm asking this is yes. I'm literally right near Clark right now. Oh, and really? uh, I refer to Worcester as the armpit of New England, you know. So I have to ask you, you know, let's face it. Worcester's not the prettiest place. But how did you end up there? So it's a stinky armpit. 
uh, you know, so what happens, I, I finished my PhD in Southern California, Claremont Graduate University. The Claremont Colleges are sort of a, think of themselves as an elite clique of, you know, Ivy League schools in the West, a very intense school. But there were no jobs in 91. And that was just about the time the Samoans folded. So I went into the postdoc at UCLA for two years, still no jobs. The only job offering I got was at this art college in Santa Fe, the College of Santa Fe. And it was it was, it was a liberal arts college for mostly art students. So I mean, in a math class and a calculus class, I would teach 10 students. You know, then it got, became five for four or five years later. And so it was it was tanking. And the Christian brothers, the same ones that make the wine, um, ran the school. They had their hearts in the right place, but they weren't business people. So the school just folded later on. So they wouldn't tenure me in 1998. And I panicked. I mean, I was out of a job. And in, in academia, if you have a hole on your record, no matter why, it's, it's, it's a blemish. So I panicked and took a job at Clark. And Clark's a great school. I mean, it was, it was yeah. maybe best academic institution I ever worked for. And so I was really excited. But I mean, I'm I'm a kid that grew up in Southern California and then in Santa Fe with a lot of sunlight. And I moved to, to Worcester in, night, in July. And as I remember, the first day that the sun came out was in October. I'm not used to that. I started getting so depressed and anxious. I had one room in a, a rental house that my wife and I at the time had with 10 full spectrum lights. And I was bathing, please help me, please help me. So it, it became untenable. And then Worcester itself had Ralph's Diner. Yeah. Uh, it's still around, but it was the only punk rock place that was going on. But it was just, I mean, there's no academic community. There's Worcester Polytechnic, there's Holy Cross, there's Clark. They're all great schools, but there's no center. They're all off in the hills on the side. And so there was no community and I felt really alone. And I kept thinking, what did I do? I think looking back, if I had lived in Providence, which is a little more you know, palatable and commuted to Worcester every day might've been tenable, but it, it was a bummer. I, I mean, it was just, I'd never been in a place where I was so unhappy. And when I, I told the Dean of the college, you know, the after year, because I had gotten great student evaluations and I worked well with the math department on papers. Everything was great, except for the fact that I just not only hated it, I couldn't stand it. I was a meltdown in Worcester. And uh, I told her that. And she goes, what if we give you more money? Well, no school has ever said that to me. I mean, in the one hand, I was so stoked, you know, and, and she started like tears down her eyes. You've done so well with this lower level class and no one's done it. And I just said, I can't do it. And if you tell New Englanders, you know, that you can't deal with, you know, their their climate and all that, that look at you like you're crazy. Where would you want else want to live? I mean, all the foliage that, you know, all foliage they talk about when I was there, all the smog from the Ohio River Valley comes across and hard to see. So did I, you go to, I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I was going to say, did you go into Boston a lot or is it just? Yeah, no, I did. I saw, I remember the highlights were going to Boston to see gigs. Like I saw Dave Davies play. I saw, I can't remember what else, but it was, you know, that was great. And I love Boston, but you know, it's an hour, an hour and a half drive each way. And it just, be, I was so exhausted and psychically thrashed from Worcester. It was just, I just plotted my whole strategy to get back to the West anywhere, because that's where my DNA is, I think. Yeah, it's a very depressing city. I yeah. I was, I've lived in, you know, all over the country. And I had, I came back here because I have older parents here, you know, and Worcester's just, it's a little better now, but it they keep saying, oh, Wor Worcester's the next big thing. I'm like, when's that going to happen? Ralph's is still there, by the way, and it is oh, really? a good club. And really? there, you, you can see good shows at Ralph's. And yeah. that's one good thing about it, you know? Yeah, no, I mean, it was, it was just not what I expected. And, you know, I gave it a shot and I got a job at New Mexico Highlands University, which is a four-year uh, college with a graduate program and that was much better it wasn't Princeton but it was or Clark but it was still got me back to Santa Fe and you know so that's where I was for 20 years after that it seems like there's a long break here in between the late 90s and when you uh 
put out your single, which I'm going to talk to you about. I dreamt yeah. I met Lou Reed, which I love that song. Uh, what were you doing during that time? Were you doing anything at all musically or were you just taking so, a break? When I moved to Santa Fe in 93, everyone was saying, oh, you're so lucky. You're going to really like this. And that's not Worcester, you know, <laughs> but, you know, the, you're gonna, it's so creative. Anything goes, you're going to flourish. And I went, so when I stuck my head up from the ground in 93, it was the most reactionary, stuck in the mud place I've ever been to. All if you didn't play Hotel California, you know, or the Eagles, you know, songbook, you were sunk. I mean, it was a bunch of really, and it still is a bunch of stupid hippies and bad R and B hacks and bar bands that you know just stick your finger in the back of your throat and vomit. But once I was there <laughs> for a year or two, having said that. If you go under the surface, there's a lot of cool people and interesting things going on. And maybe that's true of every place. But I, I happened after two or three years. That I should tell you, I went to a lot of, played a lot of open mic nights just for lack of anything to do. And I remember going into one place where they'd pull your name out of a hat because they wouldn't give you the time you were playing. So you had to, everybody had to sit through everything. And before they called me, there was this, kid who was strumming and strumming on stage and playing and then finally he goes if everybody would just love one another the world would be a better place do you know how a dog throws up like bleh, bleh, bleh. i mean i thought how much worse can it get <laughs> and then as i said a year or two three later i saw this band play one of these little off the wall clubs and they did these obscure kinks covers and ray davies is my patron saint of songwriting and it wasn't just kink stuff that was really obscure kink stuff so we became friends i thought i was just drooling like oh my god maybe there's hope and they knew about rocky erickson who was a friend of mine in the 70s and i loved his stuff um and and we bonded and so in 1996 i think we formed a band called the blood drained cows which was a garage punk band but more 60s thrash related and we got the name out of the paper, local paper in Santa Fe, because there were all these, as you've heard, dead cows eviscerated with no blood. And there was no sense of, you know, footprints or anything. It's the typical crazy story you hear. So the cops and the uh, people investigating it brought uh, one or two veterinarians out and it quoted them in the paper saying, you know, we don't know much about this. They're just a bunch of blood drained cows. I thought, bam, there we go. So I used that name and we we put two CDs out, this one in 1998 and one in 2003, the latter of which Andy Chernoff from The Dictators produced. Wow, I, I didn't know about these. Wow. Yeah, I, I flew him out to New Mexico and he stayed with me for a week and um, doing this. And uh, and they're really good. I'm really proud of those. Um, you know, we didn't sell hardly any and Triple X put those out. They really supported us. I got to look those up. I missed that. I, I, yeah, text me, you know, your address, and I'd be happy to send you those. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, but you know, the you know, fast forwarding a little bit here because I want to get to your newer stuff. Uh, yeah. Billy Bill Miller, he's a guy that you is that his name, Billy Bill Miller? Yeah, well, yeah, he, he put in the Bill in the middle name just because <laughs> there was a Billy Miller from Norton Records who eventually died, so he didn't want any confusion. He's a genius. He's he's the most. He's he's total prodigy playing the auto harp. I mean, just and he's an encyclopedic about you know all these crazy song music from the sixties. He loves Joe Meek, who was sometimes called the British Phil Spector, and uh, did all this loopy stuff, including Telstar, which wound up being a hit. And Billy digs all that. I mean, he, he and I hit it off immediately. He was the electric auto harp player behind Rocky and the Aliens in the late seventies. Really. Yeah. So I latched onto him and he was crazier than Rocky. Um, I could go on. And I usually do to a fault with my friends about Billy stories and I won't, but he's so talented and he makes all these, he's totally in resonance with what you're doing, um, <clears throat> making all these crazy sounds and he can sound really beautiful and, and just, you know, uh, but then he could sound discordant and just totally asynchronous, which sounds great also. So I've I've known Billy since 1976, 77, and I've been in touch with him ever since. And he's on all my records. 
That's oh yes. So the the single that you guys put out, um, I have to ask you because you know the Cream yeah. Magazine connection. Did you actually ever meet Lou Reed? I did an interview with him. Wow! So, and there were people who were Bill Holdship told me, who was my editor at Cream, told me something similar. And uh, it wasn't for Cream; it was for something else. I'd also interviewed John Cale, and uh, people were coming out of you know the interview shaking their heads. He doesn't want to do this, and I went in. And I just said, start gushing, you know, you can be an asshole. That's sort of what Bill told me happened. And, uh, you know, but I, you changed my life. You were a game changer in the 60s when I was growing up as a young kid. And he's like, all right, ask me questions. Wow, <laughs> that's cool. I think <laughs> Bill said he had the same experience. Uh, uh, anyway, um, yeah, so I, I forgot what you asked. Um, it was about the single, because I like that single. I mean, I was heard weird. it. I don't think it was a single. It was just off my first solo album called Plays the Hits. Oh, there was never a seven inch of that? Not that I know of. I mean, maybe oh. but I, maybe someone bootlegged it or something. Why was, did I think there was? No, it was, it was off the first, uh, it was one of the songs on my first solo record in 2013. Play the first, Hits? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and so... Um, by the way, on that, that I really like that record. I'm very happy with it. Um, the story of that is uh, Marshall Crenshaw, who's now a friend of mine, was uh, traveling across country. And my friend Ron Spencer, who's a graphic artist that did the cover of Back from Samoa, and we've been in touch. He moved to Santa Fe a long time ago. And so Marshall knew him and stopped in and Ron gave him the Plays the Hit CD. So Marshall played it on the way to L.A., I guess. And there's a song on it called Santa Fe that I think is really good that I wrote. And he loved it. And he just about a wow. year or two ago covered it on his latest record. And he did a beautiful version of it. It was so, so much better than what I did. You know, wow. uh, I mean, they're just different. But he, he did a beautiful thing with this really cool slide guitar going through it. Um, you can find that on YouTube. He's playing with the Smithereens now, right? Once in a while, yeah. Marshall's a very talented guy. I love all his stuff, so it was very flattering uh, to me that uh, he he would cover that. Uh, play the hits in 2015. Chart busters in 2017. Was I imagine these titles are like tongue in cheek? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, <laughs> chart busters at selling 50 copies, right? <laughs> Well, I like your songwriting and I wanted to talk to you about the new record because I yeah, really sure. like it. Uh, I, I'm going to tell you this, and I mean this in the most complimentary way. Uh, there's some real Jonathan Richmond vibes happening here. Okay. Cause I, you know, I right. grew up in New England here. So Jonathan right, yeah. Richmond's like God here. They're trying to make Road Run of the state yeah. song, believe it or not. I've heard that. And, you know, the song, What Can I Do to Make uh, You Love Me? Yeah. It's unique in its own way, but it reminds me of that. I, I like medication. I like why can't you come? That, sit, that guitar. And yeah. um, I wrote this down because I wanted to remember this. And why can't... First of all, let me just go back for a second. Right. You, you, can you accept that as a compliment that I'm telling oh, you? John, Jonathan was a close friend of mine. I loved every single thing he did. He's still playing, I think. Um, you know, but... Uh, so I tried, you know, it just naturally my proclivity is to lean in that direction because I'm, I'm sort of like that a lot. It wasn't trying to imitate it. It was just sort of, well, if he can do it, I can do it too. Um, but I didn't want to sound too much like that, although it comes out, I think, so on uh, plays the hits and maybe more so on chart busters. It leaned, I think, too much in that direction. So on the new record, um, I, I sort of was self-conscious of that and tried to steer away a little bit, but my voice is sort of like his and uh, I, I'm, I'm not at all, you know, I, I find that more of a compliment than anything. Um, on the, By the way, on the guitar on Why Can't You Come? So if you listen to the first two SRC records, as I was telling you before, um, and you can look, there's a song called Black Sheep that you should look That's up. That's the Detroit band, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, they were huge in Detroit and Ann Arbor, but nowhere else. I mean, a little bit in the Midwest and they had three albums out on Capitol Records, you know, from LA, but that was when major labels were signing a hundred bands and dropping 99 really quickly. But they had Gary Quackenbush, their lead guitarist, played this searing, overdriven lead guitar. They had a guy that played a Hammond organ 
And one of their biggest influence, it turns out, which are my patron saints, was Proko Harem. Oh, and, yeah. You know, so they were a little zombies, a little Proko Harem, a little crazy psychedelic feedback guitar. They were just an amalgam of everything I loved. And I'd never heard anybody put it together to such an, uh, an incredible degree. And it was also, they were remarkable because, you know, Iggy and, the, and MC5 and all of that, we're leaning in a totally different direction, but that was the whole Detroit scene. Mitch Ryder, Bob Seeger, the Amboy Dukes, all those bands were just, you know, heavy R&B guitar bands. These guys were coming from a different angle and became so popular. So in answer to your question about the guitar, it was a cop of the guy in Gary Quackenbush in um, SRC. I played that sound, although my friend Bill Phineas Luke, who was the lead guitarist on uh, Songs for Sparrow, I sat him down and said, I want to sound like this. Can you do that? And he goes, yeah, it's not hard. But overdriving it isn't easy because the electronics that SRC used is a little weird. They overdrove, I think, a Vox amp in a certain way where you get that incredible searing feedback without um, you know, excess sonic feedback that sort of destroys the whole thing. Anyway, so that's that was the idea behind that song. Did you do you feel like you accomplished everything you wanted to accomplish from all the previous solo stuff with this new record? Yeah, I think it spans a pretty wide degree of what I'm about and what I like. Um, I, I'm really proud of this last record. I think it's the most professional and uh, together thing I've ever done. We have a new lead guitarist. Phineas lives out in L.A., so it just wasn't practical having him be part of the live band. So we got this kid, he's 25 years old, I'm ancient, and uh, <laughs> knows every MC5, Stooges, all of that stuff, because his dad lived in Detroit, and he was, I think, sort of force-fed that formula. And he's really good, but he isn't on the record. So um, we're, we're tailoring our, a little bit more garagey our sound to him to accommodate what he does. But Phineas played on Songs for Sparrow, and I think he just did an incredible job. He's so classical. And professional sounding. I love Detroit so much. So many great musicians come from Detroit. I mean, you can't go wrong with those guys, man. Check out check out Black Sheep on YouTube from SRC. Just an incredible home run anthem. I have a good friend who's older than I am. He's like in his early 70s, and he grew up in the Detroit scene. I'm sure if I mention that band to him, he's going to know who they are. And the crazy <laughs> thing is the lead singer and songwriter, Scott Richardson, who did a lot of stuff. In fact, he was in this obscure 60s uh, garage rock band called The Chosen Few with Ron oh, yeah. Ashton and James Williamson. Yeah. And um, so he again, moved to this little wine village in New Mexico called Dixon, halfway between Santa Fe and Taos, and about five years ago, and, and I had heard rumors of that, and I thought, no way, what's he doing there? And I made a total nuisance out of myself when I found out that was in fact true, and begrudgingly, he agreed to see me, to meet me when he came down to Santa Fe, and the sign records and all that, and uh, we became besties ever since. We're collaborating on songs together. And it's just, again, things like that, you know, when you connect with what was just spectacular as a kid growing up was just amazing to me. That's fantastic. Uh, you 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 mentioned the live show. Are you doing anything out of the area or are you just doing local stuff for now with the new record? It's hard to do out of the area unless you're, uh, you know, have a band with a name. Like, for example, my I love the Breeders. Yeah, they're great. Kim Deal is just way up on a pedestal for me. Anyway, so yeah, it's hard. We just came back actually from Los Angeles and played a show in Long Beach, Ventura, and then uh, Silver Lake. And that was great. I mean, but it's expensive. I, I lost $3,000, $2,500, you know, fronting all the costs for the band. And, uh, you know, it's going out of town unless you have a built-in huge following. It's very difficult to break even. So I want I want to ask you about your book, but you I'm going to skip that for now and go to the question that you just kind of led me to. Okay. Um, you've been doing this as you know as a performer and a writer and everything uh, since the 70s. I want to ask you, what changes do you think have happened in the music business that are good 
and if any, <laughs> and what are the bad things that have happened, which would kind of lead to you saying what you just said, where you have to spend all this money to go out on the road. I mean, what what do you what have you seen that has gone bad and what has gone good? In the 80s, it was so much more egalitarian in the sense that everybody were I hate it sounds so cliche to say this, but everybody were brothers except the Hollywood people that hated us. But aside from that, um, everybody was in the same group. There was tons of fanzines, college radio stations got on board. It, it was a media sort of, um, you know, circle jerk. And I don't mean that in a bad way. Um, you know, so it was different. Now it's just so compartmentalized and so diffused and so gobbled up by corporations that there's there's no room for bands starting out for that if you don't have a built-in following it's it's very difficult and you know i think I, i'm an old lefty from the 60s you know i think i just reread das kapital about six months ago and you know fucking marx was right capitalism is a soulless system that just mm. is is sort of an ai system where it just feeds on itself for the sake of profit and and no conscience to art and i think that's what's happened I mean, you know, it just seems that it's, you know, the industry has cannibalized itself. And the only way bands can make money now is to tour. If if you're in a band like, you know, like you know, Keith Morris's band, the Circle Jerks or the Breeders or bands like that that have a following, they have to play out because that's the only way they're going to generate any revenue. What about the whole, the Internet and all of that? How do you think that's affected all this? Well, I mean, even things like Spotify and, and you know, YouTube, you don't get any money from that. I think that, uh, you know, YouTube is good uh, in terms of promoting things and people having access and, you know, Instagram and, and all those things are good. But it's un totally unclear to me how that launches popularity or reinforces it. My daughter, my 19-year-old daughter, whose name, not so coincidentally, is Nico. Um, she has a nice... <laughs> She has the record Chelsea Girls on her wall. She's proud of that, which is great. So she listens to all the 60s stuff and 70s stuff. I mean, you know, not like a lot of kids her age. And she came to me one day and said, you know, the version of Sweet Jane on Rock and Roll Animal sucks. The one that the Velvets did on Loaded is so much more personable and feeling. And as a parent, I just went, ah, I wow. Say, I've never so, heard anyone say the one on rock and roll, rock and roll animal sucks. I think that record sucks. I mean, it's just so divorced from, <laughs> and as she said, the personability and, and yeah. the feeling of that stuff. Anyway, you know, it's just but, the guitar part at the beginning of Sweet Jane that I love so much. Uh, you, well, know, Wag, you know, Hunter and Wagner are yeah. great musicians. I mean, that's, they're, they're terrific, but it, it it's a 180 from what I loved about the loaded song. Yeah. I hear you. Um, I unfor I have to admit this. I have not had a chance to read your book, Hallucinations from Hell, Confessions of an Angry Samoan. It just came out, though, a couple of years ago, so I'm not that far behind. Yeah. If you wanted to describe the book in a few words to get someone to read it, well, how would you describe the book? Well, first of all, it's not a musical memoir. So when you say Confessions of an Angry Samoan, that's part of the title, but it was sort of more conceit than it was a description of what the stories are, although there's a few stories referencing the Simones. But I, I, I'm a storyteller to a fault, and most of my friends are so sick of hearing me tell crazy shit stories of things I've lived through and observed. I'm a journalistic voyeur. You know, I'm a, I catch a muse, and whatever mm -hmm. crazy stuff is happening around me, it sort of is indealable in my head. And I used to write these stories on scraps of paper and on my computer. And it just occurred to me that why not see if anyone's, you know, any publishers interested in doing it. And so there was one story in the book called The Poet. And this actually happened, like all of them, where I was sitting in a coffee place. And in the adjacent room, there's a group of kids around a table. And there's this guy who looks somewhere between Salvador Dali and the old martial arts kid guy in, um, what was the movie? Um, karate kid and they're all they're all taking turns yelling out topics like you know like divorce uh you know uh, what was the other one um love uh you know um jerry mathers you know and so they're all going and he's going eight six 
seven. I thought, what the hell is this? This is like some crazy group therapy or a play or something. And I start taking notes. And that's one of the stories in the book. Uh, and, and then, of course, the whole uh, meeting of these people got out of hand. Um, things like that I love. I mean, just, you know, it's sort of a continuum of uh, participation and non-reality that captures my just captures my interest so all these stories um you know were put together and the, the hardest thing is it's one thing with an oral narrative you know telling people stories it's a totally different thing as a written narrative and so i wanted these stories to have an energy a punch a real beat to it like sort of like Kerouac, ginsburg uh, Bukowski even, you know, I wanted the writing and the sound of the words and the cadence and all of that beyond the literal transcript of what the stories were about. I wanted that to have a real sort of volition and energy. And I, but on the other hand, there's a balancing act because you don't want that to take over and obscure the ideas of how, you know, um, larger than life, these details of the story are. So I, I hope that came, comes across to people reading the book. Oh, I, I, I want to read it now. <laughs> okay. It worked. Yeah, well, you know, there was, there was uh, one story called AOK Pest Control, which was the name of these pest ridders I hired to clear the rats and mice out of my house. And the guy brings his son with him, who was this nitwit 30-year-old that, uh, you know, acts that used to pitch slop in a hog farm. And... Uh, <laughs> You know, my daddy, he came to rescue me. I, I sure do like and like getting rid of being a good pest ridder instead of a you know dishing out that hog slop. <laughs> and the old man was talking stories about how he used to run down the driveway and try to kill the rats, and he impaled one with a wood shard and said, "You know, I'd never done this before, but I had to taste what Mister Rat you know was all about." So he nuked him and ate the rat. And I just as oh. I'm. On, Honest to God, this happened. And I'm taking notes in my head and thinking, this is too good to be true. And the guy was also an Elvis impersonator in Reno, Nevada, before he started being an exterminator. And so he gets on the roof at one point and starts singing <laughs> Love Me Tender as he's spraying the rat's path on the roof. Oh my God. So wow. you know, this kind of stuff was just irresistible to me. I, I, I couldn't let it go. And that's mainly the book. I, I don't, you know... The publisher is called Rare Bird Lit, and uh, they're good guys, but they don't do much to promote or, uh, you know, really market the thing. So I think we sold like a thousand copies, which on the one hand is pretty good. It's, you know, it's not going to make the bestseller list, though. I'm still going to get a copy. <laughs> Again, text me and I'd be more than happy to send you one. That would be awesome. Uh, yeah. Thanks a lot, man. It was fun All talking right. to you. I knew you Bye. would be an interesting person to talk to. That's why I, hope I, I wasn't too boring. Oh, know? not at all, man. I tend to ramble. No, this is very good. Thanks. And good luck with the new record, too. Oh, thank you. I really appreciate the interest and I appreciate the fact that you like the new record. I, I have a lot of sort of, uh, uh, what's the word, um, you know, personal sort of attachment to the songs because I just think they're different. And I, I, I really appreciate the fact that you like it. I do. Thanks, man. Thank you. I really appreciate this opportunity.